I have an eight-year-old daughter named Molly. And when Molly was five, I took her to her first carnival. She actually got one of those ping pong balls into one of those tiny fish bowls and won a goldfish. I wasn't quite ready for a family pet, but she was so excited. She named it Swimmy, and I took her right to the pet shop and bought her all the supplies, the bowl and the little stones and the deep sea diver to go in the bottom. And the pet shop guy taught me how to do the fish. I'd never had a fish before. And with the water conditioner, and you have to worry about the temperature and how much food. I took it home, got Swimmy all set up right next to her bed. The very next morning, I hear Molly scream, and I know exactly what's happened. I got to make a mommy decision fast, right? Oh my God, her baby's dead. <laughs> no, 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 I tell her. Swimmy's fine. She's just sleeping. That's how fish sleep. <laughs> I'm sure by the time you get home from school, she'll have woken up. Molly goes to school. I fish out Swimmy, put her in a little plastic bag, go to the pet shop, and I say, I need another goldfish that looks exactly like this. <laughs> I cannot be the first mother to do that, right? I make the switcheroo, Molly totally buys it. Three days later, <laughs> really, three days later, another scream, Swimmy's dead, again. <laughs> I figure, how many times can I run back to the pet shop and do the switcheroo? So I feel like, okay, no more denying it. I'm going to have to face facts and talk to her about life and death. And I do. I do my best to comfort her, and we get on with the funeral. <laughs> Molly puts Swimmy in a little Band-Aid box lined with cotton balls. This is actually Swimmy. <laughs> yeah, that's the fish. And she makes a, a, a little gravestone, you know, one of these grave markers. It says, wonderful fish. <laughs> we dig a hole in the garden. We do a funeral procession around the yard. We, uh, we bury Swimmy. We set up the gravestone, we put little stones around the grave, and we recite the Kaddish, the traditional Jewish prayer for the dead. <laughs> the next day at school, Molly dictates a story to her teacher about the whole experience that she calls, and I quote, the worst day of my life. <laughs> the next year, another funeral. Another fish. This time I figure I'm going to get it right. I go back to the pet shop. I splurge on the big tank with the pump and the filter and the tubes and the whole nine yards. It buys me a week. <laughs> another dead fish, another funeral. Last year, funeral time comes. Not, fu not funeral time. Carnival time comes again. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Oh, my God, another carnival, another funeral. Carnival, carnival comes again, and I sit Molly down, and I say, Molly, no more fish. I'm not bringing home another goldfish. I've had it. She says, Mommy, Mommy, you killed my fish. <laughs> I say, I didn't kill them. I think those carnivals have, like, sick fish, and you get them, and they don't really last. But I'm also feeling guilty about the fish. I tell you, maybe I did do it. But I say, Molly, look, let's face it. I don't know anything about fish. I don't know how to take care of them. And I'm just afraid that if we get another fish... It's just going to die. And before you know it, we're just going to be having another funeral. So Molly says, but funerals are the best part of having a fish. <laughs> <laughs> right? Kids get that there's something important in the difficult moments of life. They don't try to avoid them or deny them like we do. They're not as attached to their old stories and, and not as averse to revising them. What I'd like to share with you today is a simple algorithm about stories that explains why it is that some of us live fulfilled, authentic, even extraordinary lives, while some of us look back and realize we've lived someone else's life. And I call it the crash theory. And I'd like to begin with a hypothesis that all human beings share the same basic, big questions of life. Those really, really big ones. What are they? This is the audience participation part. <laughs> big questions. 
Why am I alive? Who are you? Who are you? Who am I? <laughs> right? <laughs> the first one, is, first one is who am I? Then it's who are you? All right, what else? What else? The big ones. Does the soul survive death? Good. Does the soul survive death? What happens after we die? How did we get here? How should I live my life? Where do I belong? No matter your race, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender expression, every single one of us shares those same basic big questions of life. I believe it's encoded in our DNA. It's what it means to be a human being, to have those questions. Every culture, every religion, every tradition comes into being for one and only one reason, to answer those basic questions. And it does so by means of a master story. If you're Jewish, that's called Torah. If you're Christian, scripture. America has its own master story, the American dream. Every family has a story. This school has a master story. And as long as your master story is working for you, you aren't even aware that you have questions. You don't walk around asking, where do I belong? You know. How should I live my life? You know. Who am I? You know. But, and this is important, every story will ultimately and inevitably crash. An event will occur that makes your master's story no longer work. Or you'll find another story, some of whose answers you like better than your own. Or something inside of you has shifted. You've changed. And your master's story no longer feels right. Now you know you have questions. Now you've got to figure out who you are what you believe, and how you're going to live your life. You were raised to go Ivy League since you were three, and now you realize all you want to do is be a chef. Crash. You break up with the one you thought was the one. Crash. You marry the one you thought was the one. That's going to be another crash, believe me. But that's a different TED Talk. <laughs> I was raised in a traditional Jewish family. And by the time I was 14, I began to suspect that I was gay. It was 1974. There was no modern family, no internet. And all I knew was they put people like that in jail. But there was a woman's bookstore in the nearest big city. And I'd heard or read somewhere that they had books about being gay. Thank God for women's bookstores. And so I'd take secret trips there on the train, and I'd read as much as I could, as fast as I could, trying to figure out if that was me. It was. Crash. There are three and only three possible responses to any crash ever. Option one. You deny the crash. You say, no, 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 that didn't happen. That's not me. That's not true. And you revert to your master story, and you hide there. And you build a wall around that story. And you make sure that any threatening information stays out. I remember when I was 15, I had this green leather Eisenhower jacket. You know, short, military style, epaulets on the shoulders. I love that jacket. I was a waitress at the local deli, and one night I wore the jacket into work. And my boss says, you're looking mighty dikey today. That was the last time I ever wore that jacket. I took it off, put it in the basement, never wore it again. That's an option one move. Every option has its upsides and downsides. Upside of option one, you get to keep your master story. It's familiar. In a lot of ways, it's really comfortable. And you get to keep all your goodies. OK, maybe not your Eisenhower jacket. But you get to keep all those perks that come along with being accepted and approved of. And the people who used to love you still love you. Downside? It's denial, right? You're going to have to be doing a lot of denying to make this option work. And you're going to have to stand guard on that wall 
to make sure that all those pesky, inconvenient truths stay out. Or option two. You go the opposite direction. You accept the crash, and you figure, if a part of my master story doesn't work, the whole thing is a crock. You reject your master story, and you jump off into a new story. Remember, you're always in some story. The only question is, which story are you going to be in? When I was over there in option one, trying really hard not to be gay, I fell in love with a woman for the first time. The moment she kissed me, I understood that love is love, and love is good, and that I was good. And I realized that it was my master's story, the one I had inherited that was wrong, not me. And it was option two, here I come. And I came out big time and dove headfirst into the lesbian community and pretty much just lived there. I dropped out of pre-med and became a shoemaker left the Jewish world, and became a Buddhist. My parents were so happy. <laughs> right? Jewish mother's dream. I tried to get, yeah, not so much. I tried to get as far away from my master's story as I could. I actually moved to Japan. I did. You cannot get farther away from Chicago than Japan. And you know what? I had a fabulous time. Fabulous. That's the upside of option two. You don't have to deal with a master story that doesn't quite fit. You are free now. You are loving your new master story, and you are having a good time. And I was happy, happy for a while. Because downside of option two, option two is a baby with the bathwater kind of thing. And when you completely reject your master story, you also get rid of all the good stuff that worked, the stuff that was true. And you let go of parts of yourself that you later realize are just not negotiable. And remember, every story will ultimately and inevitably crash. And this story, too, is going to crash. And you're going to have to jump off of it into a new story, and then another story, and on and on and on. Now, if you look carefully, you'll notice that option one and option two are the opposite sides of the same coin. They share the same wrong-headed underlying premise, the myth that stories are fixed, eternal, and unchanging, that you can't be queer and Jewish, or differently abled and an athlete, or black and the president. But stories do change. It's not an unfortunate fact of life. It is life. It's how life nudges us forward. Most people go option one or option two after a crash. That's just what most people do. But there's a third option, option three. And what I want you to do is go option three. In option three, you don't deny the crash and you don't reject your master's story. And option three, you take the crash and you use it to understand your master story, to figure out what works and what doesn't work, and to retell that story. That's what I call a traditionally radical move. So here's how you do option three. When you smell a crash coming on, slow down. Take a deep breath. Relax. Figure out exactly what master story is actually crashing for you. That's important. Then embrace the crash. Own the truth and take it with you. Then go back to those basic human questions. Remember, that's your ultimate goal, to answer those questions. Who am I? How should I live my life? Where do I belong? Go back to your master story. Really examine it. Understand it. Figure out what works, what doesn't work. Take with you what works, leave behind what doesn't work, and retell your story. Tell your story and live that one. Option three is not only how you become an authentic person. It opens up new story possibilities for everyone else. 
That's how you change the world. When I was over there in option two, trying really hard not to be Jewish, I realized that we don't carry around our stories, and you can't just put them down like suitcases. We are our stories. Sitting cross-legged in a Buddhist temple, at a certain point I realized I just didn't feel whole. So I started to learn about my tradition, my Jewish tradition. And I started really learning, and I fell in love with it. Six years later, I became a rabbi, a queer shoemaker rabbi. And now I run a school for traditionally radical Jewish innovators. That's what my option three looks like. And now my parents are so proud. <laughs> they really are very proud. Now, option three doesn't have the black or white kind of clarity of the other two. It's messy and complex, just like us. And you never know if you're getting it right. But option three is where you're going to become who you really are, where you're going to figure out what you're going to do with the story you were given. P.S. You remember Darwin? What did Darwin say? He said that nature compels every living thing every day to make one of three choices, adapt, migrate, or die. Familiar? Adapt, option three. Migrate, option two. Die, option one. Isn't that interesting? Crashes happen, and they compel us every single day to make one of three choices. Option one, option two, or option three. Every one of you here today is in the middle of a crash. So am I. We all are. And you might be hanging out in option one or hanging out in option two. That's OK for a while. But don't stay there. If you do, some part of you will die. Little crash, little part of you dies. Big crash, big part of you dies. I want you to think about that crash and imagine what it might look like to go option three. And give it a try. There's a Jewish legend that says that every blade of grass has its own angel that bends over it, knocks it on the head, and whispers, grow, grow. Every crash is an angel that bends over you, knocks you on the head, and whispers, grow. It's the best part of having a fish. <laughs> Thank you.